Welcome to the Watson Weekend. I'm your host, Rick Watson. As always, coming you to with you live from New York City. Um, this is actually our final show this side of Christmas. It is episode six. It feels like we've been doing this a lot more time, and we have our usual fill of stocking stuffers here to warm you up during the holiday season. And the best thing, no more Christmas puns when we get to January. Oh, I don't know. I think I might pull in a few here and there. Like the fun, <laughs> the fun just won't stop. And who knows what is going to be in store for us in January, except the only Nostradamus-like prediction I'll have for you, Rick, is you're going to be pretty busy. You've got a life-changing moment, right? Life-changing moment, uh, 100%. We got a baby on the way, and I'm excited uh, for what's coming. Yeah, me too. Um, so we got a lot going on this this week and a lot of action-packed topics. You want to run them through, Rick? Let's pretend I'm a professional here. We have a few topics. One is Andy Jassy uh, just appeared on Jim Cramer last week. We're going to go through that. Second is we're going to like peer a little bit out into the retail future, talk about where retail is headed. We call this segment Future Gaze. Uh, next is Joe from Marketplace Pulse, who we love here on the Watson Weekend. He submitted uh, a full 2023 report of data for us. We're going to look through a year in review from Marketplace Pulse. Uh, in Q1 and Q2 of next year, we're going to talk about a few events to attend, what things should be on the lookout for your e-commerce and retail needs. And of course, who else? The Happy Jess Happiness Index. Uh, and so that. we're super happy. And unfortunately, this is going to be our last show before the holidays. I don't know. It's a bummer. This has been the highlight of, of my week for the past six weeks. <laughs> Hopefully it has for everybody else. Uh, we learned how to pronounce Sheehan. I think we did. You know, uh, Kramer and Jassy confirmed it's, it's Sheehan. So the experts have spoken. Uh, we learned that robots uh, are not yet ready to take over. And I think we've, we've gotten some insights there. I didn't actually think the happiness index would last as long as it did, but we're still kicking it. And I think we're going to find some new ways to bring that into the new year. Uh, it feels like we didn't have enough to fill every single week. I didn't think we would when we started this, but the hits just keep coming. There's there's lots of action packed news there. So um, 2024 is going to have a lot in store. I think it's going to be interesting. We had a few topics that came up. I mean, some people gave up on e-commerce, um, clearly Kohl's and Meta. Don't really think e-commerce is a thing. Clear, uh, inflation reared its ugly head, uh, particularly in the beginning of the year. It started to slow down a little bit toward the end of the year, but consumers have not noticed if inflation is getting better. And I'm sure we're going to talk about that later in the show. Um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, what me worry? Like Alfred E. Newman, uh, everyone seems to be out and spending like a YOLO. So I'm not too worried about that. Singles Day, eh. Not so much going on. And of course, Ben Kogan was on the show a couple of weeks back talking about VC or venture capital 3.0. So that was a lot of fun. It was, yeah. I think that was a, a really nice takeaway. And we've had such great guests. You talked about Ben, but I feel like every week we keep setting the bar and someone else brings a new perspective to what we're talking about. Today's not gonna be any different. We've got Nick Kaplan here. Um, and so I'm just really excited, uh, before we jump into getting and introducing Nick though, we thought it'd be fun to reflect on the holiday ads and what's been happening in the season. So, um, <laughs> I know Rick, you don't watch a lot of ads, right? I watch zero ads. I'm more of a Netflix guy. Yeah. I kind of feel like it's my job to watch ads and, and I don't know why I still like them. Uh, this one's one of my favorites. I thought Walmart did a fantastic job as they reintroduced Mean Girls to uh, how they bring Black Friday deals on Wednesdays. So instead of on Wednesdays, we wear pink. On Wednesdays, we get lots of good deals. And the minute they launch this ad, we actually you know, track their traffic and uh -huh. huge, huge spike. And at that, like the hits have continued to come. Um, so I thought that they did a really nice job with this one. And then Charlie's Bar was the sleeper. I huh. don't know if you saw, saw this one. Now, you are a talker. So on the top, <laughs> this one really hit its stride. And why I love this one is there was a lot of ingenuity here. This was a small pub in Ireland. They shot it with an iPhone. Um, it was a little sad. It wasn't that happy. I like found myself tearing up a little bit. And I have a right. soul. So um, this one really tugged on my you know dark heartstrings. 
And some of the best holiday ads are ones that kind of make you cry a little bit. I yeah, mean, you kind know, of the way it is. They really do. And this is like um, the old, uh, you know, the, the John Lewis. People even said this was better than John the John Lewis ad, which was also supposed to like evoke this beautiful memory. So those were two of my favorite. Um, and I know that Nick has a favorite. So why don't we bring Nick on and uh, let him kind of talk about his favorite. Uh, and while we're queuing that up, I think we want to do a little bit uh, about Nick. And if you want to introduce yourself and then we'll do our two truths and a lie and you can talk about your favorite ad. Got it. Uh, well, it's amazing to be here. Highlight possibly of my year. I don't know. Uh, I'm excited. So I met Rick a couple years ago. Uh, we live in the same neighborhood. So we <laughs> had a breakfast and the rest is history. And here I am, guest number six on the show. I have done a lot of different things over a long, too long career in this business. Um, but building communities and commercializing them has sort of always been at the, uh, at the center of it. So with that, um, I thought that the Travolta <laughs> ad was like, who thinks up these ads? I thought there was a lot of good ones, but that to me was just like perfect. What was your favorite part about it? I mean, the music and the memories that it evoked of Saturday Night Fever and yeah. of, you know, him. He, he, he has this charm and this sort of, you know, resonant people. And it was just fun. And I think it blended a lot of what companies are going after, which is like this kind of message of positivity and happiness and engagement and trying to sort of stick. Right. So I, yep. I remember him, the beard and everything he was doing. Yeah. And this one was city. Is that right? Was yeah. This, yeah. 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 Uh, was it city or capital one? I think it was capital one. Yes. I like right. it. How you guys like to add so much. You don't even right. remember who the hell it was for. I mean, you just I like mean, Pulp Fiction. Like, let's just we know it was for a financial services company. Yeah, we, because financial services and Travolta, Saturday Night Fever, they all make sense together in a world. Right. So, um, right. You guys, let us know what your favorite ad was. I'd love to hear in the comments what, what have we not talked about that just struck a chord with you. Uh, while you're doing that, we are going to get into the two truths and the lie. So, uh, Nick, you've probably, you have watched the show, so you know that this is one of our favorites. Um, so here we go. You are one of three children, uh, played soccer for a U.S. team, or he was a child model. A child model. This is impossible. One of three children. I was a child model. I I'm going to go. What's the right answer? You are correct. Whoa. <laughs> I can't believe you got that. That one's tough. Well, you I played mean, soccer we, for a U.S. team. A U.S. team. So I was not like at that level, but a level <laughs> down. But I did go to um, Brazil and Argentina. Played a few world tournaments my senior year in high school, and then that was it. I was done. And then, um, yeah, I thought the sibling one would kind of catch you because, you know, my brother is more around than my sister. <laughs> but I do have a sister whom I love very much. So I'm one of three. And uh, right. I, I mean, I couldn't go with like all these other fun facts because you know them. <laughs> you guys have covered that on all your coffees, your coffee yeah. meetings. That's yeah, right. We talk. I don't know. Nick, so... Nick only goes to one restaurant. If anyone knows the Smith in the Upper West Side, it's it's the only restaurant Nick goes to. With Rick. <laughs> with Rick. Okay, got exactly. it. Okay. So, like, you've tried everything on the menu. You guys know all the things. Yes. Uh, Although Nick only I, orders one I, thing. I, I say I order the same thing every time. I mean, I'm like that customer, right? Like I'm loyal. You know, there's not a lot of generative AI thinking about what I'm doing when I go to the Smith for breakfast. All right. So, great. Well, well, Nick, we're learning lots about you here. So uh, you also introduced, you have your own word of the week. My word of the week, and this is a tough one too, because there's <laughs> so many things happening. But what I did is I took all of my thoughts and I typed them into chat GPT and I said, Give me my word based on everything I'm thinking. And it gave me back what I wanted, which is resilient. I think that what's happening in the world of retail and consumer facing businesses at the moment requires fortitude and it requires most importantly resilience in a moment mm. that isn't easy. And I think we'll probably talk a lot about that during the When I heard this is your word, I thought you were also referencing the consumer and how resilient the consumer seems this Q4. Um, but yeah, there's like lots I, of 
there. Yeah, I'm, and I'm I'm sort of a, a taking a longer approach and saying that when all is said and done, with the consumer won't have been as resilient. It's us that needs to be resilient in this time where we need to get to the next place. There we go. Uh, the the word is resilient. Keep it keep it close, folks. We're gonna probably harp on it as much as Andy Jassy did. Uh, yeah. Ooh. Speaking of Andy Jassy, I mean, I think it's time to get the show on the road. Uh, first up. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, Andy Jassy uh, spoke on Jim Cramer last week, which is usually the place you go to kind of like pump up your stock. You see like Harley loves going there. Um, and so Andy and Jim spent some quality time together. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. Uh, what did you guys think about this? I have a couple of things uh, to kind of come up here i mean so they sat down side by side and like old friends and it's a little bit of a cupcake interview here are a few of the topics they talked about i mean i don't know if you have any of you saw this in the audience i wrote about it a little bit earlier this week um if you have any comments about what andy should have answered during the call or if you had any thoughts about what was happening please put in your comments in the initial look you go on cnbc you're going to take a victory lap what is a victory lap? The victory lap for Amazon in this situation is primarily about their fulfillment network. Andy took a huge bet really in the past year and a half. If anyone remember, 2022 was like a terrible year for Amazon. Like even especially at the beginning of 2022, middle of 2022, people were like, Andy Jassy, what the hell are you still doing here? Should we have chosen Dave Clark? Um, or Jeff Wilkie as CEO, who are two very senior executives that left in the past few years. But Andy Jassy, here's a, some things for him this year. The stock is up 70% this year, which of course Mad Money like went bananas over. He's not building a new playbook. He's like reinforcing the current playbook. So just a couple of stats. In the top 60 metros, like cities in the United States, 60% of parcels are same day or one day. And they redid all their placement algorithms for like where they put inventory, which means that their operating income really shot up by something like 40% year over year in the last earnings call. And they even started to have sub same day facilities where, and you know, do I believe this stat? I'd like to test it actually, 11 minutes from the time you click the button to the time the item ships. Bold statement. If you're in the comments, please talk to us about that. Like, do you believe these stats? Have you witnessed them? What do you think, Nick? I think that he has incredible media training. He continued <laughs> to go back to customer. Um, I thought it was interesting to sort of get some insight into what they're thinking. Um, as a resident of New York City, I have yet to get anything offered to me same day. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly nothing I want. Um, but I do think that their future as a logistics company and what he said about um, the dig at Shopify on the ease of building a website and the difficulty of acquiring customers and shipping packages isn't not true. But I definitely <laughs> think that that 60% is a little suspect, but little it's certainly, high. we've thought this before about Amazon for years and years and years, people were highly critical of the long bet on building the community and monetizing it. And ultimately it was AWS that allowed for that, but I don't not believe in Amazon either. I think it's a hard yeah. thing to not go with them. Yeah. yeah. I'll just add that I, like you said, Rick, I mean, this was fully a double down on the core playbook. And I love why you captured this image here because he talked about selection, the uh, delivery, that pricing, right? Mm. Great deals. He mentioned how many great deals they had, you know, tens of thousands on Black Friday that they continue to launch more every single day leading up to December 24th. And I think that it really just reinforced that this is what has angered Amazon and their success and they're doubling down on it. It was also interesting because it's the first time I've ever heard an executive at Amazon mention care and sellers in the same sentence. Yeah, I thought that well, one was an, a, a new uh, groundbreaking thing. 
<laughs> it, it's super interesting you say that because actually, you know, in, in thinking through the interview now that you sort of like set off the thought is the deals. I mean, the amount of, of talk to deals, 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 and deals spoke to, you know, I think he mentions they have 1% of global commerce yes, he and did. Yeah. that he was so passionate about the customer on the one hand, but providing them value. Yeah. And the other, I think was definitely something we can't discount. Yeah. And he also Get talked it? about consumables, right? And this whole strategy of, because, you know, Kramer was asking him about trading down, which I agree with you, Rick. It was like cupcake. I think they're going to be text besties from now on. But that, uh, you know, he's talking about how these consumables and how Amazon is now in the consideration set, which I also thought was teeing up grocery a little bit and how they want to go after grocery more. He started talking about Tide detergent, and paper towels and those types of things and how they're really focused on getting those in that whole same day ecosystem, which is going to help the customer decide, hey, I don't have to walk into the store, which he also mentioned, Nick, it's 80, remember 80% 80 of retail still happens in store. So he wanted to ding, ding, ding. And now we're going to give people reasons to not go do that. I thought that was interesting of how he led into that whole talk track. Yeah, let me continue it on. Like he, he was asked directly, I mean, this was the hardest hitting question, maybe the whole thing. Nick, you mentioned 1% worldwide market share. Um, Andy kind of uses that as an advantage against the FTC. Like, Trust us, we're not a monopoly. We only own 1% of worldwide retail market share. And so Andy ain't afraid of no Timu, just like the Ghostbusters. I mean, come on, I'm a kid of the 80s. So we're going to talk about the here. Andy, as a defense, like he uses Timu answer as a defense of his FTC lawsuit, I think. So here are a few talking points that he went through. 80% of retail is in stores in the United States, outside of the United States, 85% of all retail global e-commerce is um, in stores. He actually went on to defend Amazon's value prop in the market. We have the largest selection and the lowest speeds, and we really have a good pulse on what the consumers want. And by the way, we have like 15% lower prices on the, this basket of consumables that we track. And he basically painted Timu as and Xi'an and the whole sort of Chinese brigade as niche players. This was the same playbook Amazon, re, you know, ran against eBay yes. back in the day. Amazon's like, eh, hold my beer, uh, just watch. Like we're gonna take over the world, and no one wants to wait seven freaking days to run an auction. And do you want to spend that much time on the Timu app to wait for a deal? Even if it's a fake 11 minutes and you're not going to get it like Nick said in New York City, at least Amazon is trying to do it. Yeah, they are. And I also thought he he was like, and, and we're friends. I mean, Shein has a store on Amazon. Have you checked out that store? That shit has not been updated. <laughs> in freaking I love months, that comment. First of all. And then secondly, He's like, and Lowe's, I mean, Lowe's sells on Amazon and they have their own store. So I just thought he's like, we're, we're frenemies. Do you believe that, Nick? Amazon is going to lever Timu and Shein as competitors to mitigate what's coming from the Justice Department. <laughs> I think the only person Amazon, at least today, has to sort of give any thought to is Walmart. I don't think why they'd care about anybody else. And I don't think that Walmart's looking to the breadth of what Amazon's doing in terms of entertainment and in terms of uh, infrastructure, but I am amazed that more importantly, the United States government, who is always looking for a bandwagon to jump on, is still allowing duty-free goods to come in from China. I don't think that these guys are really even in the boardroom discussing Timu or she, and I think it's just like they'll be gone soon. Some we're lobbying already behind the scenes to get. <laughs> we'll shut the, them down. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And Nick, you forgot though that Walmart launched their rom com, their shop com series. Oh, I mean, remember entertainment? They, they that this is their pay. This is their. I, pay, so. I think Walmart Plus is awesome. I mean, I think it's it's something that um, truly does add value to people, and I think the way they've done it has clearly added value. To, to them is a competitor to Prime. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, look, one thing I'll give Walmart credit about, they have a, a fail fast, like a test and learn mentality yeah. and exploit opportunity. I mean, nothing says to me, I heard about this once and I never really believed it. And I've, I've Googled it multiple times. It's true. There's like a weather center 
in Bentonville, right? They're tracking the weather. They're predictively thinking about like where weather patterns are going. And then reactively, like they're sending goods to places where weather is impacting. I mean, that to me has always been so interesting. It's this demonstrative of like their model, but no, Timu yeah. is like, who, what? No. Yeah. Well, I think it's uh, good if you're if you are, are good, Rick, with moving in, because we've got this now nice transition into what is the future of retail and where we're we going. And you mentioned Walmart, Nick. And I thought it was interesting that, uh, you know, T.D. Cowan came out this week saying that Walmart really is the innovator of the year. They believe that that's like the retailer of the year in 2024. And it is because of the things that they're doing. They've you know doubled down on grocery. Uh, so you can like ding me later. Uh, you know, they've set up a tiger team to rally around AI. And that, right? <laughs> that. I just on a, on a roll here. Uh, but then they've also just looked at they've probably one of the best examples of a market retailer in a marketplace success. Right. And how they've introduced that to really broaden it. Um, but what else do you kind of think about when Walmart retail or just how do you think about the future of retail? Nick? Big topic. It's, this is actually something Rick and I have talked about over our coffees is I think that I'm smart enough to know that tomorrow will definitely be different than today and that we're moving in this direction of sort of, you know, everyone talks a lot about meet, meet them where they are. Yeah. And I think it's more aspirational about like, you know, people say one to all and like one to many and one to one. I mean, I think we're like as close to one to one as we've kind of ever been mm. in terms of how we kind of put something in front of someone when they want it or even introduce into things that they don't know that they wanted. I know <laughs> I wanted this and we're heading in a direction of, you know, my big thing is like peer to peer. We've seen kind of what moves the needle, right? So number one, it's price. I mean, price is like the number one thing that informs a consumer's purchasing decision. But number two, what do you think number two is? Convenience. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Trust. If I'm telling you, Jess, oh my God, your jacket's incredible. It is incredible by the way but if your jacket's like incredible you're like oh my god i'm gonna go buy another one because my person i trust is telling me so i think we're finding affiliate networks in the non-traditional sense driving mm -hmm. more dollars and in investment and in time focus because at the end of the day i'd love to say that meta you know google sort of kind of go away they don't i think eventually Pmax Negative. does it for does it for yeah. us right i think like it's like Pmax in google their product is terrible today it's gotten a lot better the adoption rate's going up but um, it's not going anywhere right i think that what is going somewhere is how in fact we sell to people right i think those mm -hmm. become part of the ecosystem you know i think um you used a word there um nick i just want to make sure everyone understands what it is google advertising product Pmax talk about it for 5 seconds what is Pmax a black box. Give us your money because we know what to do better than you know what to do. And it's like, we're going to take it and we're going to distribute it amongst our network. And, you know, when it first came out, because at the time, you know, I was with Sadia and, and we were a fairly big client, we definitely had early access. And it's like, wait, what happened to smart shopping? You know, she gone. Yeah. Um, and I, I get it. Pmax is effectively Google's black box to distribute your advertising dollars in the most efficient way. And efficient it, for who it, is the question? Well, I think it's, listen, in this world, hopefully we're all smart enough to know everybody's got to win, right? That's sort of the problem. Amazon's building this network of people whom it's almost like sort of doling out just enough for them to get a taste to be like, a, you know, addicts, right? They can't live without it because Amazon is in fact providing traffic. Amazon is in fact providing logistics, but Amazon, you know, if Amazon doesn't like you and you do something to get knocked on the, the knuckles and they like move you aside as some of the litigation, you know, says like you're in big trouble. So I think as we start to think about the world outside of Amazon and what kind of businesses succeed, it's those that, you know, effectively can in fact lever these traditional means of like Pmax or, you know, paid social inside of Facebook or Instagram, and then can start to layer in these peer to peer networks that many people think that attribution is sort of the only thing stopping it, right? Which is the three of us are out selling something and, hmm. you know, we all sort of have an assist in the sale who gets credit for it. But as I look at the future of retail, I think there's a lot of it that stays traditional, right? I think stores stay important in doing some research recently for something I was was writing. There's three different channels that contribute to a purchase. 
Um, you know, I think that about 55, 45 seem to be the split in US between e-commerce and physical retail with physical retail winning. And I think that, you know, 78% of people are on their phones inside of stores helping to make decisions. We will see a world where there's got to be some sort of price value brand loyalty equation in it. But I think we're going to see something that's like very fluid um, and very different. And I know I'm going long here, but I'm very passionate about this. No, Visual, I, search. Yeah, Visual I, search changes everything, by the way, too. Yeah, yeah. Right? And my wife texts me yesterday and says, my daughter wants these Uggs. I'm like, okay. And, and by the way, we celebrate all holidays, Hanukkah, Christmas. Like we're, my kids are rounding the corner now. They're heading home into Christmas. And so there's still opportunity. And I like to do the visual search. I'm like, sorry, they're sold out. They're not getting them anywhere. But I was able to sort of quickly from my seat, not go out to the mall, to the shopping center, to the local person. I wish I was a formal child model. I may not be sitting in the seat I'm sitting in right now. I may be sitting in a very different seat. I could be like on Oprah. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, well, I said I a lot. I think it's a lot of what you you raise. Um, I just do have a quick tip for you. I mean, you can get some fake ones on Timu. Uh, there's 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 lots of right uh, comment of the day. Uh, you could there. buy a Dak Prescott jersey, but it only says the Scott and the number four from the Dallas team as well. Yeah, $10. yeah, yeah. So so in the other you know future state of retail, and we've seen a lot of volatility in department stores. Right, you've got now this five point eight billion takeover of Macy's. Uh, which is really about the real estate. Kohl's is always, you know, struggling. Sears is making a comeback. Do we really need it to? So what's happening with this department store landscape? Can it survive in this next generation of consumers? Look, uh, Jared brings up an interesting point. I, like, let's see if I can get to the answer to your question. I think department stores, particularly that don't embrace mobile, are in trouble. And I think Jared highlights here is like visual search is key, which is a point that Nick brought up. And... There is a gap between in-store and online in one sense, but in another sense, the consumer is like, I'm in the store. I want to find out, is this a good product? Am I looking at the right thing? And I think, you know, we used to call it showrooming and I think everyone was afraid of that. And they realized that the whole world is a showroom. And to the extent that you can provide better digital information to your consumers than anyone else and get to that trust, which is... You know, the reason why Amazon launched their whole reviews program like what, like 25 years ago, that was about trust. And so I think the, the stores that understand trust are going to do well. The people who are running away from e-com and digital like Kohl's, I'm not sure they're going to be around in five years. You've got to have some layer of differentiation. And I do believe that future of retail also includes services. It's why people do love Instacart. It's why people you know, are adopting different types of apps. It's if you can make my life easier, we want to make your life easier. And I think there's still a lot of that missing in retail is what is the differentiation that if I've got a, a black dress or the same, you know, Tory Burch shoes as every other department store, what am I doing different that says like shop here? And it can't just be, I've got great merchandising anymore. There's, there has to be something else on top. You see it in the retail earnings is, uh, obviously everyone knows that retail is hard. It's a three to 5% margin business period. And one of the, a long-term trend in the past, like when I say long-term, at least the last three to five years, part of the revenue stream that is going down is what? Private label credit cards. Mm -hmm. Who the hell uses a private label uh. credit card anymore? Like apologies to mom. It's terrible. And so it seems to me like retailers at least the ones that are not digital forward and don't take advantage of retail, things like retail media, things like you mentioned services, yeah. Jess. I think these things all tied together. And I think companies like Walmart, who is has data services, they have fulfillment services, they have their marketplace, they have their retail media. All these things are the future of um, Walmart's revenue stream. And I think the best retailers kind of look like that, the percentage and growth of their advertising program, it's embarrassing. Walmart is, again, T.D. Cowan's best idea of 2024, and we're going to see if they live up to it. We do want to talk about what's happening with the consumer. How are they feeling? What's happening around them? And are they going to be resilient? Or is it we have to be resilient? So let's kind of dive into the happiness index. What do you think? We're prancing. There's a lot to unpack. We had a jobs report this week. We have 
also uh, what's happening with the consumer sentiment. We have a Fed update. We also have the CPI index. We're going to start with the jobs. Last week, Rick, you told me this was the consumer downer index. We added 199,000 jobs, but such a large percentage of those were in government and healthcare and 34,000 jobs that were impacted because of the United Auto Workers strike. And so that kind of flipped the data, 5,000 new jobs from other sectors. So it doesn't really bode that well from an economic perspective and just what consumers are feeling, especially when you think about all the number of layoffs. So we can go to the next slide where that growth was. Um, and I think then we get into the unemployment rate. So yes, that was a little bit better news. Uh, but when we get into the CPI index, this is what I think gave some people some hope. It's coming down when you normalize for food, which can is what can like, drive some volatility here. This was really a good news type story. Um, you know, it was a little bit higher than what the expectation was, which we thought it would be flat coming out of October. It was like a 0.1% increase. But 70% of this was tied to shelter, which we all know rent prices are high. We also know inflation is very high on mortgage. I think that people felt a little bit more optimistic after this came out. I think people, meaning economists, yes, yeah. felt better. People who can't find houses or can't afford, you know, to to move because the mortgage mortgage rate is still twice as high as it was three years ago. I'm not convinced that just because you say it with a smile that we aren't still in the in the downer index here. Jess, what do you think, Nick? I'm with you. I, I call it my uh, my my milk index, going to the store to buy milk. I mean, milk, it's just incredible how far up it is. And I do wonder across the board, you know, and obviously it doesn't necessarily factor into the CPI, but in in a lot of pockets where prices just reset and you know how did that mm -hmm. happen and in the end the, the roll in the roll down like the trickle down to the consumer because at the end of the day and i think this is driving a lot of my thoughts and i wrote about it a while back on on linkedin you know in terms of um fourth quarter but this doesn't you know obviate that the credit card debt is the highest it's ever been and so while there seems to be this talk about everyone saved up for December and there's this positivity. It's like, I get it. But at some point in time, like we're consumers are going to, they're going to pay the price. Right. And I think that, you know, it, it factors into this, but no, I, I don't think it's as rosy a narrative as this is sort of painting. All right. So we've, we've established that people, our economists have printed out this chart and they put it under their pillow at night and it's helping them sleep. I got one more thing to throw at you, which was the University of Michigan put out their early read on the consumer sentiment. And uh, this was actually a, a positive story. Maybe maybe people in the Midwest are just happier. I don't know. It hasn't really started the, the groundswell of snow dumping on them yet. So I, maybe that's what's going on. Um, but ultimately, you know, year over year, this was a, also a positive story. We had a 16.1% change, uh, but also, also in the month over month, these were pretty positive in all three things that they measure consumer sentiment, what's your take on the current economic conditions, um, what's your consumer expectation for the outlook. Um, it's 39% above the all-time low, which was measured in June of 2022. We're still well below what it was at at pre-pandemic levels. Mm. Um, so I don't know, what do you, how do you guys like read this in, when you take it into context of everything else? Is it holiday I mean, spirit? What is it? I mean, as an old school retail guy, I'll tell you like, <laughs> it's just a comp it's like if i'm comping a negative 50 percent with a positive three percent it's like it's a positive three percent but it's a comp i don't know, rick do you agree with that i mean so you give me I, a thumbs up right I, I i agree i mean look it's um you're happy to have the bad comp and i think we've been comping so from such low levels the past few years that anything looks like a win and especially if you're a retail operator look you'll take it because you're gonna get your bonus this year that's, right that's the story. One other leading indicator here that probably will bring back the consumer downer index was for the first time, they've started to see people pop around election as well. Yes. So it's a 14 percent um, increase in people starting to mention the 2024 election, which we all know will like drain the life out of everyone. That's Why, Jess? Why do you say that? Yeah, I, I we, that's for a whole other segment. I want to be the guest like 
number 32 for the week after the election. Oh, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm putting in my request to be the in the hot seat that week. We definitely need, we'll need booze for that, no matter what happens. So th that will be a booze friendly uh, episode. All right, so we're going to wrap it up. We have one more thing to talk about related uh, to what's hitting consumers, and it's the Fed update, which also sent the markets. Harvey, Jerome Powell, they both said we're done. So are, are do we think that the Fed is done? Uh, I don't know if the I think the Fed is done. I think my 401k thinks the Fed is done, and that's good enough for me right now. Nick? Agree. I saw the breaking news and then I went to E Trade. I was like, oh my goodness. I was like, green, 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 green. It's no different than kind of the future of retail, right? You know, there's this sort of, I'm full of expressions and, you know, focus on fundamentals is one of them. And sure, po positive sentiment, you know, and momentum in the market is terrific, right? And there's people who are very successful trading on that both ways. Like there will be a reckoning, right? I think if you're, able to evolve and make money and paint a picture that you can deliver on, then you'll be well thought of, but I am not buying it. I mean, I, uh, I'm telling you, I, I think you four, you know, a lot of the conversation is like about top line and consumer sentiment. I mean, no one's talking about bottom line. And I think if you look at Andy Jassy's deal, 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 that's great for Amazon. It's terrible for sellers. Yeah. And margins are thin competition is fierce and costs are going up but consumers voting with their wallet are yeah. looking for everything to kind of come down so happy to see I, I kind of agree. Said, my yeah. 401k go up but like the day of reckoning is coming is what we're saying i know yeah i, so I kind of agree with you nick i mean if you look you go to luxury retail luxury retail is getting crushed right now and we talked about Farfetch last week, which was a lot of fun. Why is it do I think Farfetch is so beaten down? I went to their website. It looks like a freaking Macy's. Is Farfetch still in business right now? I wasn't it's, sure if they've yet. Depends on what minute you ask. Well, you know, most of these people wait till January, right? Because they get all the coffers full. And then yeah. so I think we have a lot we're going to learn in January about these businesses. Or you could be Etsy and you could be like, books need to start looking good now. And we're going to. Cash, <laughs> cash is cash, right? I mean, you got to. True story. Academy payroll can't operate without it. Well, it's so as we keep talking about 2024, we're going to wrap on consumer index. What are the events that we want this audience to know about that should be on the radar? What should we be caring about when we get to 2024? I mean, look, you have the stalwarts, and I'll just start with the basic ones. Uh, you got to be at NRF in New York City. I think that's a big uh, event. Got to be at Shop Talk. Those are kind of the big two. So NRF... Um, what January sixth, somewhere around there. Uh, 8th, January fourteenth, fifth. Shop Talk March seventeenth. But I'll be back for Shop Talk. That'll be my first for you guys in the audience that are looking to see me. I'll be speaking at Shop Talk this year. So really excited to see you. Um, any events on your radar, Jess? I mean, I have the same ones you mentioned. Uh, there's also just getting back into kind of the the industry events from like from my perspective. So I think it's really important as a retailer, we've got to get back out into the the like core trade shows. I think that broke away in uh, during COVID times. And so getting back into some of those events are more specific to me. Uh, Jared saying, let's all meet at the E-Tail Palm Springs lobby bar. Um, I didn't know people were still going to E-Tail, but yeah. Jared, we might see you there. I don't know. I think you have to, I mean, and again, I know we've gone a little bit long, so I'll try to, which is hard for me to be succinct, but I always tell young people I work with, like, build your brand, right? Get out there, get involved in some of these communities to be able to go to dinners and meet people. So I think two interesting, I mean, we got to give props to the lead because thanks to Noah and so on, so on, like, I wouldn't have met Rick, so, and I met him on a panel. Um, and then oh. I, I think, com you know, if you're in New York, I think Commerce Next is, is like, I think Veronica... Um, they do a yeah. great job. Yeah, yeah, yeah Alan Scott, Scott I Alan, mean, right? I, I just think like what what they do is they build community too. So like, it's in, yeah, whether it's internal, external, you know, like connect with people, right? I think that hopefully yeah. people are listening to this because look, I'm a little bit of a fan of you guys. I mean, I'm psyched to be on here, but I think learning about what people have to say and being part of communities, whether it's like NRF is huge, so go there to see what's happening in the world. But everything else, go to build community as well as learn and connect with people to further your career, further your education, and just like be relevant. 
It's so true. And and Jared, Etail has a very special place in my heart because Palm Springs is is beautiful. So I would love to bring that one back. And it's the best place to be in February when the weather sucks. So I am I am with you. And I agree, Nick. I think that that is what's the magic about this retail community is it is small, making these connections matter. And you never really know where the next opportunity is to help out someone in the industry. And I think that's what we're all trying to do here is just share information because it's more about um, what you share than what you know. So we're better it. together. I love it. I'm like, my heart is warmed here. I mean, I, I really love, I mean, if you've been listening for 45 minutes, first of all, thank you to the one person in the audience. Uh, we're super excited. Holidays are coming up. I mean, put your feet up. What are you doing for the holidays? I don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. I mean, it's like with my kids and they're on different schedules. I think we're going to go away for a few days, but I think we're going to be in New York. I mean, for a few days as well. So how about you? I you am building there? a crib. That is what I'm doing the holidays. Good luck with Jess? that. You're yeah. not outsourcing it. We're going to Bush Gardens, man. We're going to ride some roller oh, coasters. You know, I got, I have kids too. Although my kids and I mm. might want to come back in their next life as your kids, Nick, if you're celebrating all the holidays, because they are just counting down the days till they're opening their presents. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. Yeah, we're ready to uh, get the music coming up in the club. Nick. Only a couple people I'll do this for. 